Uh, we have Liz McPherson here from the University of Canterbury. Uh, Liz is an Associate Professor of Law uh, at the University, specialising in Indigenous and Environmental Rights to Natural Resources. She co-leads with Eric Jorgensen, research examining how far we can go with an EBM approach to marine management with existing law and policy. Liz, welcome to the mainland. Um, and I'd like to invite my team to come and sit next to me, would be great. Um, I am going to talk to you about law and policy for EBM. This is my team. Um, so I'm not here on my own. I stand with an interdisciplinary team of amazing researchers um, with expertise across the social and physical sciences. Um, I want to especially acknowledge my co-leader, Eric, um, but also all of the other people here. So Hamish, Adrian, Andrew, Karen, and we also have um, Judy Hewitt, who's not with us, and Julia Talbot-Jones, who's not with us right now. Um, I also want to acknowledge those who have taken the time to engage with our research across Māori organisations, government, um, local government, industry um, and hapū. I also want to acknowledge our strategic advisory board of Legal Eagles who have provided oversight and feedback on the work that we have produced um, and as it has developed have continued to stay engaged. We know that there are multiple laws and policies operating in the marine environment in Aotearoa, and these are not always well aligned to each other. We've heard lots of talk about that this week. Um, and they don't always take an ecosystem-based approach. And this is often referred to as fragmentation and seen as a problem that EBM needs to solve. More on that later. We also know that there is a complex network of largely Western laws and policies affecting Māori relationships with the ocean. And there are many great researchers in the challenge um, across a range of projects um, who are working on this and many of whom we have heard from this week. And this is just an example. And that's just the human systems there's also incredible complexity, constant change, and dynamic relationships and, feed and feedbacks in the social ecological systems that exist within our marine environments. This is a multi-species system map that was prepared by Andrew Ellison, Eric Jorgensen, Judy Hewitt, and Justin Connolly in collaboration with Fisheries New Zealand and is an attempt to map the complexity of relationships and feedbacks of fishers and related people in Tasman Golden Bay. And I know that you can't see the detail, but the point is it's incredibly complex. Our project sits alongside and takes direction from research on Māori law and policy by experts and other projects. And I would like to acknowledge Beth's team, Lara and Dan, um, Robert Joseph, you've just heard from, John Reid and Jason Mecca, and there are many more. Within our team, we're lucky to have, and I'm going to embarrass you, Adrian, Adrian Paul, our Māori legal expert, who helps provide a bridge to that knowledge um, and make sure that our work supports Mātauranga and Tikanga Māori. It is essential that law recognises jurisdiction for Rangatiratanga and we see Mātauranga and Tikanga as critical to the implementation of EBM across all sectors and across all scales. And when Eric and I spoke about this yesterday, he summed it up nicely. He said that Mātauranga and Tikanga are everything, everywhere, all at once. So in terms of our project, we have these three research aims. But today I'm going to focus on the third aim, opportunities for law and policy to support EBM. And I want to draw attention to the word opportunities. 
And I think it's important to clarify that we are not policy makers and we are certainly not decision makers. Some of you are, and our role is to develop the research that can help you and inform you in making those decisions. I also want to emphasise that scale is very important to the work that we are doing, and Joanne Ellis is going to talk about this later on. But for now, I'd like to highlight some of the research that we have done um, and the relevance that it has for policy. For our first piece of work, we decided to look outside of Aotearoa at attempts to embed EBM in laws and policies. And one thing that we found is that everywhere we looked, no matter how good law or policy looked, there was incredible complexity and fragmentation of marine law across different sectors and scales. And we concluded that some degree of fragmentation is inevitable in the marine environment because of the complexity of the ocean and human relationships with it. So this meant that we should avoid the temptation to try and create one law to rule them all. That in fact, our attention should be focused on combinations of policies and laws and rules and institutions to support EBM. We found that the best way to support EBM was through a combination of what we called anchors and hooks. And by anchors, we mean high-level norms or objectives that set a vision for EBM to apply across sectors and scales. And by hooks, we mean combinations of rules and institutions to support an EBM approach, which could remain in sectoral legislation, but should at least be aligned to each other. We also found everywhere we looked that indigenous rights and authority were unfinished business, that resourcing and funding was key to the success of law and policy, and that marine spatial planning might be a hook, but that EBM is much more than marine spatial planning. We spent some time thinking about how EBM sat alongside attempts already existing in law and policy to be more integrated or more collaborative. And we argued that EBM is not an end point to be arrived at, and then that's done. It's an ongoing process that continues to adapt and iterate as interactions and collaborations in different rules and organisations in the policy space continue to evolve. So EBM is really about relationships between peoples and marine places. So we can't just create a law to do EBM, we need to focus on the processes and the capacity of people to support an EBM approach that will just keep on going and keep on adapting as change keeps happening. In our second piece of work, led by Steve Ulich and Hamish Rennie, we looked at existing legal and policy mechanisms that support EBM at the regional and local scale. The focus of this research was the relationship between the Fisheries Act, the Resource Management Act, and the Marine and Coastal Area Takatai Moana Act as they affect marine environments. And we showed here how decision making under each of these laws applies across different spatial and temporal scales, as you can see in these maps. Each of these laws has different purposes, and this makes it difficult to effectively align their regulatory tools. But there were a range of legal and policy tools already existing that could support EBM, although they were not well implemented. So we emphasised here the need to resource capability at the regional level to integrate and develop these underutilised regulatory tools. The next piece of research, led by Karen Fisher, traced possibilities of supporting EBM in trends and governance approaches in Aotearoa. And we found that environmental governance is undergoing a shift, one that increasingly emphasises collaboration, go governance, um, between government and communities and the importance of place-based decision making. There is also a shift in governance approaches in terms of how the environment is viewed by people, which is informed by and better aligns to Māori worldview, knowledge and values. And the Te Awa Tupua, um, Act from Wanganui is a good example of that. We argued there that EBM is a strategic approach to managing the marine environment because of the synergies with indigenous worldviews and knowledges, particularly given this emphasis on interconnectedness, inclusivity, diversity, and relationality. 
and we proposed for PO, or enabling conditions to enhance governance for EBM, which can accommodate both Indigenous and non-Indigenous worldview. So, the pressing question underpinning our work, how can law centre the health of ocean ecosystems and related people in integrated marine decision making in a Tiriti compliant manner? Which brings us to the largest piece of work in our project on designing marine law and policy for the health and resilience of marine and coastal ecosystems. Um, this will be published shortly in Oceans Development and International Law, and then we'll work on um, drawing out findings to target to end users in the, in the right format. To tackle this work, we undertook a detailed analysis of opportunities for law and policy in Aotearoa for EBM. And this was big. This model sets out the parameters for our study. We focused on four core areas of law and policy, fisheries regulation, biodiversity conservation, managing environmental effects, and Māori tiriti rights. We applied learning from earlier research, including our hooks and anchors approach, looking for examples of where law can support relationships between people and place um, in diverse ways. And we were also conscious of the need to, EB, to implement EBM across temporal, spatial, and jurisdictional scales as well as using the usual methods of legal and policy analysis and lit review, we also en engaged and tested our ideas through workshops with people from central government, local government, industry, and hapu in place. So, what did we find? We found that there are key time-sensitive opportunities across these four key areas of law and policy to better align law and policy to an EBM approach. And we summarise these in the table. The table sets out things that we see as anchors to frame a high-level vision for EBM. This inevitably includes tetidity foremost um, and other things like international law, for example. Um, but we argue that there is a need to articulate what we call fundamental marine principles to apply across all sectors and scales. We've been listening this week and we've heard talk about lots of things that sound a bit like anchors and I was thinking, um, we were thinking that um, Beth's tikanga guardrails were a good example. We also made suggestions in this work about the enabling conditions necessary for anchors to work. Um, and more on that later. In terms of hooks, we pointed out a range of existing, developing, or possible legal and policy mechanisms to support EBM. And these need to be integrated and coordinated, although, the, as we said earlier, they may remain in sectoral um, legal frameworks. In the paper, we discussed the potential for these to support EBM and in most cases, these are laws or policies that already exist. I mean, things like te mana or te orang or te taiao, power sharing arrangements with Māori, place-based fishery collaborations. Um, but we also point out opportunities for new things, like perhaps adaptive, flexible corridor or bioregional planning um, or a national fisheries policy. In many situations, as I said, there are already supportive law or promising reform initiatives underway, but these tend to be ad hoc and they are not well integrated with each other. Which brings me to the enabling processes that would support this integration at the bottom here. And we identify Tiriti partnership across all scales, tikanga and mātauranga Māori, place-based collaborative governance and power sharing with iwi and hapu, biocultural and mixed-use marine protected areas, flexible localised risk assessments, and ecosystem-based climate adaptation. This then got us thinking about the sorts of governance and administrative arrangements that might support the implementation of this sort of approach. And this is where I need to acknowledge Eric's key thinking behind the diagram I'm about to put up. So, 
We consider that EBM implementation can and should take place across these different scales, as I've said, and should be guided by a strong anchor for an EBM approach. But for this to happen, whole of government leadership and coordination is needed across sectoral silos. Such an integrative approach is difficult, our study suggests, where officers have reporting lines and obligations only within their own sectoral line department. Many have argued for an oceans agency to support cross-sectoral collaboration and hold the government to account for implementing the rule of law. We go further and argue that Aotearoa needs a ministry for the ocean to match the ministerial portfolio of oceans and that this can, needs to reflect the complexity of marine management and depart from the terrestrial bias of our existing laws and institutions. A dedicated ministry would ensure a coherent whole of government approach to leadership, oversight, coordination and alignment of marine policy consistent with the Tiriti Partnership. So we're putting that out there. The next slide is just a bit more explanation of the elements of that um, figure. So what's next? Our next piece of work has been led by Julia Talbot-Jones, Victoria University. It focuses on transition. So how does Aotearoa transition towards EBM for marine and coastal management? This work draws on resilience thinking. Specifically, the concepts of adaptability and transformability to help us understand and define where Aotearoa wants to go in terms of law and policy and how it can get there. Our initial work in scoping out this research suggests that a shift to EBM requires a purposeful transformation, a shift from one state to another, and not just adaptation, which can involve more modest changes in the status quo. For this research, we're planning to use a vignette of marine spatial planning approaches existing in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and to show how an EBM transition could be advanced beyond MSP. Finally, I'd just like to highlight the work being done by the challenge to feed our collective research to policymakers. Um, so that they can have relevance and impact. And an example of this is the work we did on the submissions on the resource um, management reform process. This is really important work because there are some time critical opportunities to embed EBM in a range of reform projects that are underway. Nor data, kia ora koutou katoa.